Right, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you today to our third in the series of our Chambers Trade Academy sessions. Uh, my name is Susana Cordova. I'm the head of international trade at the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce. And today we will be speaking and focusing on export control regulations and why they exist. We have as our guest speakers, Jeff Gunn from Ceteros Consultant, uh, one of our um, long-standing approved suppliers. So I'm gonna first um, going to give you a very quick introduction to what the Chambers Trade Academy session is. Um, and we will have a few chances for a Q&A later on after Jeff has done his presentation. So what is the Chambers Trade Academy? It's actually a joint initiative from selected chambers of commerce, as you have seen in the first slide, where we are providing traders with virtual free sessions to members and non-members uh, covering all the bases about exporting, importing, late regulations updates, how to grow their uh, business overseas, diversify your supply chain. Combine, we represent more than 15,000 businesses um, across all sizes and sectors, but we actually engage with more than 70,000 on an annual basis. We are international trade tra uh, practitioners who work daily with exporters and importers, supporting you in every stage of your internationalization phase uh, and with the complexities of trading overseas. Uh, the kind of support that we provide combined uh, across all the chambers that are uh, participating on this initiative uh, includes international trade events where we raise awareness about different opportunities overseas, export, import, and custom training courses, best book advice and consultancy packages, readiness assessment, helping you identify the right market for your international strategy, market research and entry services, partner finding, commercial debt recovery, foreign exchange services, letters of credit, credit checks. We are also providers of certification, legalization, and apostille services, meaning we help exporters and importers with documents such as certificates of origin, import certificates, ATA carnets for temporary exports, and much more. We are also customs brokers, so we help UK legally registered traders with their customs entries for export and imports. Uh, we are here to provide you with information and guidance about going global. So now I want to welcome uh, Jeff from uh, Ceteros Consultant, who will be going into more detail about what are export controls, why they exist and why they are important and how to manage those. So I'm gonna start sharing my slides and Jeff, if you may share yours, that will be great, thank you. Thank you, Susanna. I'll just share my screen. So, thanks, Susanna, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this morning, we're going to have a, a brief run through export controls, so uh, how the export control, uh, export of controlled items works in the UK uh, and generally around the world as well, in other countries as well, uh, see how that works and a brief discussion, uh, discussion about how we know if an item is controlled or not. So it's a very high level strategic uh, discussion that we'll have this morning and there'll be time for questions at the end. Uh, if you have any questions of a specific nature, uh, I wouldn't be able to get into too many direct, specific questions against your own business, but general questions I'd be happy to answer. So strategic arms control uh, regulations. Uh, there are legal means by governments to control the export of certain goods, like I mentioned, uh, and those goods are clearly defined uh, and they're enshrined and embodied in international treaties, foreign policies of a nation, or for the defence and security objectives of that particular nation. And this, this morning we're going to be discussing primarily the UK jurisdiction. So it's UK uh, foreign policy, defence and security objectives 
uh, and the UK meeting international treaties is why we have arms control, UK arms control regulations. Uh, they can be directly uh, defined by national government, and we'll look at a few of them uh, for parliamentary legislation or through international organization, uh, organizations and treaties. Uh, some of these examples of the international uh, treaties, groups and protocols, and you'll get an idea of what we're talking about when we start looking at these uh, treaties because they're fairly self-explanatory. The Chemical Weapons Convention. So the Chemical Weapons Convention, international treaty uh, based on the prohibition uh, of chemical weapons uh, around the world. And we are signatories to that in the UK and therefore part of the mechanisms we use to comply with that uh, Chemical Weapons Convention is uh, not to export uh, items, instruments, or technology relating to chemical weapons. Missile technology uh, and missile components, again, were part of the Missile Technology Control Regime, uh, which again controls missiles and uh, delivery means mechanisms uh, around the world. So we, again, sign up to that, and you'll see that a lot of the uh, technologies and uh, goods, products are relating to uh, missiles are controlled also. Uh, nuclear Suppliers Group, uh, this covers uh, the technologies to uh, enable uh, nuclear proliferation and also uh, in the civilian nuclear side as well. So you'll get a lot of the, the, the civilian uh, nuclear power station types uh, technologies and uh, capabilities are controlled as well, and they are all defined through the Nuclear Suppliers Group. And the Vassinar Agreement, the Vassinar Agreement, uh, that was not quite as self-explanatory. That primarily deals with uh, your conventional military goods and products, so your military equipment, and they are all defined what does make a military, a piece of military equipment, and what is controlled within the military uh, equipment. Uh, and that's all agreed through the Vassinar arrangement, which is a, an international uh, agreement uh, that's signed off and it does get amended. Uh, and we then filter that through to our own national uh, legislation. So that's where uh, most of the decisions are based on what is controlled. Uh, we also have human rights uh, conventions, etc. Et as well, uh, which we'll talk about later on. So the purpose of these controls, why do we have uh, trade controls in the first place? Is to give some kind of control to the government on what uh, private business is actually exporting out of the country. Uh, and it's to make sure that the government's committee is following its commitments on a national level to non-proliferation and arms control. Uh, the, the regulatory framework that we use uh, ensures that UK science and technology is not, says they're intentionally or unwittingly used for the purpose of WMD, weapons of mass destruction, uh, WND, by other states or non-state groups, i.e. terrorism. And so it's intentionally or unwittingly. So it's up to all individuals uh, that are exporting is to understand the product and where it fits into uh, the UK arms control regulations, because we don't want to be adding to uh, our breaching non-proliferation arrangements or arms control arrangements uh, around the world. Uh, that's what you'll be prosecuted by. Uh, and that's the UK's control of that to make sure that they have a handle on it. Specifically, uh, they're there to protect UK national and allied security. Uh, we don't obviously want to be selling our secrets to everyone. We need to control that and we need to understand who's getting what, where and when. Uh, from a national security uh, side, there's certain weapon systems, perhaps, or capabilities, uh, technologies even, uh, that we don't want falling into the wrong hands. So the government has to control that export uh, from private by licensing. So you have to apply for a license uh, if your item is controlled. Uh, support non-proliferation. So this is uh, the UK doing its part for non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and conventional weapons around the world uh, uh, to make sure that we don't start uh, 
arms wars, arm, you know, to escalation and conflicts, etc., uh, and maintain regional stability. So we don't want to arm up a, a country uh, out of bar uh, and maintain and destabilize a certain region with its neighbours uh, through uh, progressive arms sales uh, ability, uh, sustain uh, process. So we have to control that. And this is what the licensing system does. When you get a license, it goes through uh, a number of uh, organizations within the government, and it's offices within the government, and they look at uh, if you are going to be doing any of the aforementioned. Uh, also prevent internal repression, human rights. Uh, oh, we'll have a look at the human rights list a wee bit later as well. Uh, and also in, internal repression can actually uh, lead over into the, the, the other lists, the military lists, for instance. Uh, there are certain weapons, uh, certain systems that might be totally uh, appropriate to sell for the defence of a nation. So every every uh, nation has its right to self-defence uh, and its defence forces. However, uh, there are certain weapons that wouldn't be appropriate, perhaps for ministries of interior, police forces, etc., where they're policing their own uh, internal uh, citizens. And so therefore, you, certain weapon systems, you might get a license for sale to defence forces, but you wouldn't get one to a Ministry of Interior, for instance. So end use is very important as well uh, when we're actually talking about uh, arms control uh, and uh, arms control licensing. So you need to know what, is, what the, the customer is going to be using it for and on whom and the purposes of it. And support foreign policy. Uh, and we see that with sanctions and embargoes. And that's flavor of the month at the moment. We see a lot of sanctions being put out uh, against organizations and individuals uh, in Russia, for example. And uh, that is where then the support of foreign policy comes in. Uh, we, we also see that obviously countries subject or individuals, organizations uh, subject to embargoes and sanctions can actually or do try to work their way around those sanctions. So you have to be particularly careful uh, if you're exporting uh, sanctioned items that they're not finding their way to the locations, individuals or organizations which are sanctioned. Uh, so that's the, the foreign policy aspect of it. And comply with international treaties and protocols which uh, the previous slide highlighted. So it's actually uh, technically illegal to start uh, shipping stuff without the appropriate due diligence uh, on the uh, international treaty side of it, protocols for uh, arms conventions, CWC, etc. How do you know if your goods are actually uh, listed as uh, controlled? Well, there's a number of lists uh, available are used by the UK government and published by the UK government, and they are all brought together in the UK strategic uh, control lists, and it's a consolidated list of goods, uh, of items that require export uh, authorization from uh, Great Britain or Northern Ireland. So you would look in your the lists, uh, and that would then define if your uh, product or goods or technology is uh, controlled or not. I'd just like to highlight now just to define technology. Technology is generally uh, defined as things like drawings, uh, plans, uh, capability to manufacture the product. Uh, so it could be intangible, i.e. it could be sent in an email uh, through the mail, you know, uh, across the, the internet uh, or downloaded from a server. It could even take the form of a telephone call because it could be information. So that's the technology aspect of it. So it's not just the physical good that's controlled. It's also the technology, the intangibles connected to that product as well that are controlled in many cases. So let's have a look at what we mean by military goods then. Uh, goods which are specifically designed or modified for military use. Uh, you see this obviously, obviously uh, often abbreviated as DMMU, designed or modified for military use. It doesn't mean to say that all military goods uh, are controlled, and it's not just weapons that are controlled. 
uh, that this list defines clearly uh, what in the military uh, environment is controlled and what is not controlled. And just because it's used by the military, again, doesn't mean to say it's controlled. You know, a dustbin to be used by the military is certainly not controlled. So once you've checked if your list, your goods are on the list for military uh, products, then you would, it would be listed and then you'd get a code for it. And if it's not on the list, you define it as not listed and it's not under military list control. So that's just to clarify that point. This doesn't mean that everything that the military uses controlled. Uh, but again, and it's not just weapon systems, it could be uh, other items associated with equipment. Uh, and that's all defined within the UK ML, as it's often, so, uh, often referred to, the UK military list. Uh, here's an example of a list entry, just to get you an example of how they're codified. So if something's codified ML19B, you see it's a, part, it's a direct energy weapon system related to countermeasures equipment or test models as follows and specifically designed components therefore. Uh, and B would be particle beam systems capable of destroying or affect destruction or affecting mission abort of a target. So that's a particle beam weapon is controlled and it would be code ML19B. Uh, so that's the way it builds up. So you've got, that's quite a high tech thing. I mean, you're talking Star Wars sort of uh, uh, lightsabers sort of things there, laser systems for uh, either direct destruction of a target or uh, to cause permanent or temporary blindness, uh, you, they would become under that uh, that class. Uh, you notice also that sometimes uh, the 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 the, the defence against these weapons is also controlled. Uh, so if you look at uh, ML19, so equipment specifically designed or detection or identification of or defence against systems in 19A or 19C. So, yeah, so if you've got uh, equipment designed to either detect, defend, or identify maybe the, 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 the radio frequencies, etc., they would, in 19C, they would also be controlled equipment and technology as well. Okay, so it's, it's you know, it's, that's an, a typical example of a codification. I'd just like to highlight here when I'm talking about codification, these are codifications from the controlled strategic, the, the, the strategic arms control lists. They're not uh, commodity codes. That is a, a, not a mistake that's often made. People start talking about commodity codes. The arms control codification is something completely different and it's taken from a different list and that's a strategic arms control list. Dual use goods. So many, dual, many other goods are also controlled in the UK. Uh, and these are available to buy commercially, typical off the shelf, but uh, they're, they're the high end product, uh, very much enhanced capabilities, and they may be useful or used in uh, chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear war, uh, uh, warfare type uh, equipment or weapons, or used in conventional weapons uh, development, manufacture, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they're also controlled, that's dual use list. And that's a, that makes up a high proportion of uh, the goods that are actually controlled. Uh, <clears throat> they're divided into different categories and the self-explanatory. You see there, zero through uh, nine. Uh, so you've got examples there of uh, nuclear materials and equipment, category zero. So that's primarily, we're talking about the civil nuclear industry there. Uh, there are a lot there kit is, is category zero. Uh, materials uh, and they would be codified as such and then you've got all the way through uh, an example of uh, a list entry and you'll see what I mean about uh, the, the equipment used to create the, uh, the controlled items. Uh, so dimension inspection or measuring equipment, equipment positional feedback units and electronic assemblies as follows. So that, that covers a wide spectrum of uh, general industrial machinery. However, if you look at the specifics of it, they get very detailed on its capability uh, and its performance. And as you see, if you've got a, a computer controlled or coordinate uh, measuring machine, a CMM, 
uh, then you've got actually then the details you can go and say, does our machine uh, or is the machine that we are manufacturing to sell within these specifications? If it is, then it's controlled under dual list. If it's not, if it falls outside that, then it's not listed and therefore not controlled. And that's a good example of uh, dual use items. They're very much divide, uh, defined on the specification of the equipment uh, as opposed to the destinations, etc. You still need a license and we would still look at that, but uh, it's all to do with the specifications of the item. And when you get into the high, high specification equipment, that's where you're talking uh, for manufacture of WMD. Uh, and they, they go through all that, you know, chemicals are in there as well, et cetera, et cetera. So PL entries, I earlier on I mentioned about uh, the UK government deciding to have its own uh, controls or re uh, restrictions on items that are not come from international protocols. So these could be uh, items that the UK decides are controlled and they're unique to the UK uh, on the, that control is unique to the, the UK against specific territories. Uh, an example of that, for instance, is the sale of aircraft parts and equipment and technology uh, going to Iran. So if you are producing any of these parts or components for, uh, then they should not be finding their way into Iran uh, under this PL9009. And this is an area that's often overlooked. And if you are controlling this, you sh even if you're selling it into the UK, you should be putting on your, uh, your commercial documentation. Uh, this item is covered by PL9009. Uh, it's ex uh, prohibited export for uh, any destination in Iran. And then everybody knows uh, that, that you can, they cannot be sending these items to Iran, especially if they're outside the country. Uh, because if you were sending them, say, to France, uh, sending any of these parts to France, and they were finding their way to Iran, you're still in breach of the uh, PL9009. Uh, and, you know, so you have to, one, speak to your uh, customer when you're doing the initial sales, and then you put it on your uh, dispatch paperwork or your uh, commercial paperwork, highlighting the fact that it's got a... Uh, a destination control on it. And that sometimes we, we refer to as destination control statements, uh, where you say, no, you can't be sending this here under UK, you know, for UK law purposes. And it's up to you to make sure that other people don't send them on as well once they go outside the country. So that's good understanding and due diligence of your customers, what they're using them for. Human rights list, I mentioned this earlier on. So we obviously don't want to be exporting uh, capital punishment products, products used for the uh, manufacture of capital punishment uh, equipment, torture goods, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, And this is all tied up in uh, various uh, international laws on human rights, UN, European uh, charters, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, declarations and resolutions. And an example of that would be, you know, a fairly straightforward example, uh, battens and truncheons and shields uh, with metal spikes in them. It's, it's it's all very medieval. If you read the, the human rights list, it's quite sort of medieval in its uh, definitions of uh, articles. But, you know, these things happen. Uh, you know, cat and nine tails, uh, good old naval tradition there. But again, nowadays it's verboten, so we can't be exporting uh, cat and nine tails and you know, whips with thought with flashes and thongs, uh, whips with barbs, hooks and spikes. Uh, it does become quite uh, say medieval in its, its definitions of things. Uh, but these things do uh, they, uh, get sold around the world. People do use them in certain areas, uh, and we don't want to be any part of that by encouraging it. Uh, so we, we make sure that we don't reach our regulations by selling these. Enjoy. Difficult to imagine any UK manufacturer manufacturing this, but it's there uh, and you don't want to be caught, and caught up in that. End use controls. Uh, now, this is, this is basically a catch all uh, control. So it basically says uh, the UK government, 
if you suspect good software technology is send, intended for military use or purposes related to WMD, uh, then it may come under a catch all. Uh, so you've got to refer to the Expo Control Joint Unit for advice uh, and for information, and then they would refer with other government agencies uh, to to get advise you on that. So again, it's you're the you're the key, you're the manufacturer, you understand what it's doing. Has it been used for bona fide purposes? Uh, and you find that out under your due diligence. Uh, if you get any any queries, you would then uh, be uh, referred to ECGU. Uh, or if you're aware of government concerns. Uh, so if you know that the government is sanctioning certain area and you think your goods might be uh, breaching that sanction or if you're un uh, unsure, then seek advice uh, and you, know, you, you make sure you're kept up to date. You should be, if you're exporting, especially if you're exporting control goods, you should be uh, getting uh, notice to exporters from ECGU, which keep you up to date with sanctions, uh, with uh, what's been going on, but they also uh, publish on a three monthly cycle uh, a list of prosecutions as well, who's been prosecuted for what and what their fines are. Uh, so that always makes interesting reading. So if you're aware of any government concerns, uh, you may need an, an, a license. Or if, or if you've been informed that you need to get an export license after getting advice from ECGU, so uh, obviously, if they get in touch with you and they don't like your product or have got information uh, about a contract you have, you may need to get a license. Uh, and again, it's always in the, the government's uh, prerogative to to not give you a license, uh, and therefore you've got issues. And I've seen that happen before, where uh, companies basically uh, get their goods impounded, uh, and you know they get stuck in the system, and it turns out that. Uh, their products are not being used for what they probably thought they were going to be used for, and therefore all deals are off. And that is a situation you do not want to get involved in, because it can cost you a lot of money uh, as an exporter and as a manufacturer, because it may well be that you uh, you can't perform to deliver a contract that you'd previously made. So you could be uh, lost a lot, lose a lot of money, especially if the items have already been manufactured. Uh, so again, due diligence. Uh, and know what you're manufacturing, know what the risks are involved with it, and seek advice and support uh, where appropriate. So how does the management and enforcement of all these regulations actually work? So when you apply for a license, if you, if you find that your license, uh, your products are licensable, you would do that through a system online called Spire, that's soon to switch over to light, a new system's coming in, along with the other government export uh, uh, computer systems. Yeah, you may have see the HMRC are updating their, their systems. Spire is the, the system used for control, uh, export of control goods and licensing. <clears throat> and that's the export control joint unit that administers that. And they administer the applications and issue of license as well, and the audit of licenses. So think of them like DVLA and driving licenses. They they do all things uh, for the administration of it. And if you get any issues, uh, contact uh, ECGU, and they issue the licenses. There's there's lots of different types of licenses available. Uh, I'm not going to go into that now. Uh, but the you know you you've got to administer all your licenses as well through Spire, and that's where you control your license management or light and moving forward. Once you put your application in, uh, this is where you see the the, the scope and uh, de uh, the the depth of the actual license uh, application process and administering that. So ECGU get the the license application, they will do a technical assessment on your license. This is where it gets uh, quite important because people often get concerned that it takes a long time to get a license or that there's an issue getting a license. So first off, ECGU will do a technical assessment of your application. Uh, and in that, they'll primarily ask themselves, do they understand what you're applying for uh, the license for? Do they understand that you what, what, you're, what you're exporting? Uh, if the answer to that is yes, do they understand where you want to sell it, uh, send it? 
uh, and the ultimate end user, uh, if that's all clear, do you have the uh, appropriate uh, documentation from the end user, end user undertakings, et cetera, uh, signing off that they're going to use it for a specific reason or whatever, and that's all in the end user undertaking, and it, it conforms to your purchase order from them as well. So all, once that all tallies up and all the technical aspects of the application have been ticked off, it then goes around uh, a virtual board. So it's uh, the different uh, government agencies, uh, the Foreign Conf Commonwealth Office, uh, the Development Office uh, for Overseas Trade, uh, other government departments. I what I maintain by them is uh, security the type departments, uh, the MI5, MI6, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they will sign off on it saying, yeah, all good to go, no problem with that. And the Foreign Office uh, is very important on that. And it's policed, the, the whole system is then policed once the I license is issued, that license is policed when it's used by HMRC. So as it moves across the UK border, uh, customs boundary, HMRC, check it, make sure it's there, make sure it's uh, appropriate, uh, make sure the all the details are correct against the, the shipping documents. Uh, and if they're not, then they'll come back to you. If there's any issues about exports not being uh, legal uh, and fully compliant, then it's HMRC that would then prosecute, uh, and that prosecution would be upheld through the Crown Prosecution Service. So that's basically the way it works. If you if you get a full fill of an ECGU visit, because if you're using open licenses, then you will get an, uh, a visit. They say, they say a visit, it's an audit by ECGU. They'll come along and look at your processes, your uh, what you've been doing and exports and making sure you're managing them appropriately inside your business. Uh, and if they're not happy, it could well be that they ask you to send a declaration, a self-declaration to HMRC and themselves to basically fess up to your infringements. If they're really bad or if they've stopped your goods going out uh, and it's pretty blatant that it's an intentional breach, then it will be HMRC that's knocking on your door and it should... <laughs> and... Uh, taking it forward from there to hand over to the uh, County Prosecution Service if appropriate. So that basically covers, in a nutshell, uh, UK strategic arms control. Uh, has anyone got any questions specifically about the, the higher level uh, strategy on export control in the UK uh, with rate to control goods? Thank you so much, Jeff. That was really good and very comprehensive. Um, can I ask you to stop sharing the slides so I can pop uh, ours? If there are any questions, um, please, this is the moment uh, where we can pose those questions and the Q&A. Uh, if not, um, I have one, Jeff. Yeah. Um, you were talking about you know, technologies being subject to export controls yeah. and ICSs. And you also, in one of the slides, I saw the software. But what about things like training, which is with the purpose of you know, military training or consultancy, which it can be quite wide in that. Is that is, are those services within that scope? Not, in a, not in a civilian sense per se. Uh, it depends what you're using as a training reference and the training reference documents you're using. Uh, if it's, you know, if it's, Highly confidential. Obviously, if you're if you're trading uh, classified material overseas, you're, you you chance that you're signed up to the Official Secrets Act, and therefore you'd be breaching that. So if they don't get you one way, they get you another. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, training devices can be uh, controlled depending on their nature, and they would be within the lists. Uh, and you know, so I have seen it. Uh, and it is, a, it is a, 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 an issue that is clearly defined in the list if the training products are defined as well. So it could be uh, for weapons especially, it could be like space models for uh, the 
you know, when you're designing garments that have a pistol, etc., then they might well be controlled. Uh, training devices, simulation devices at a tactical level can be controlled as well. Uh, so that's covered by it. But generally speaking, training and a consultancy is not specifically controlled unless you're getting into the real tactical end of it or a highly classified area, in which case, yeah, be warned. You should know better if you're consulting. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And the other thing that you mentioned is uh, dual use. And um, some of those, you know, are commercially available to people yeah. just to buy. And my question was more about, I mean, we, we've seen an increase on, you know, maybe categorized initially as toys, yeah. um, which could be uh, used potentially for, is, so in, it will those be immediately on the list, or there is like a fine line where they can just be passed as no, toys the, instead of the dual, dual use. use list. No, the dual use list is very specific in its definition and scope of uh, the of the product. So you know things that are you know decommissioned weapons are covered in the military list. Uh, if they're not lethal, if they're non-lethal, uh, look like plastic toys and they're not controlled uh, per se. Uh, it depends on what you're using them for and what the purpose is, what they're designed for, and they're designed as toys, etc., uh, etc. Et but yeah, you you'd also have to be very careful as well when you're carrying something like that in your hand luggage. Ah, that's that's another point I should mention in hand luggage. Uh, a lot of the dual use goods as well. Uh, it can be very tempting for people uh, to carry sales samples in their hand luggage, especially on very small things. If your goods are uh, controlled, do not get fall into the trap of shoving them in your hand luggage, especially things like computer boards, chips, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so just be very careful of that uh, and certain items of clothing as well. Simply because also the, the 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 going through the customs with controlled items in your 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 pair on your person is uh, very difficult as well. It's a, it's an arduous trip to go down, and it's a lot easier just to pack them up, get them licensed, and send them out, and then meet up with them at the other end uh, where they've all been appropriately licensed on a, in a temporary export license uh, or whatever. So don't try, don't fall into that trap. And be very careful with that, and don't you know? Salesmen can be particularly uh, blase with stuff and sticking stuff in the bottom of their suitcase. Uh, it's not worth the the, the issue. And um, in terms of once you understand that you do need a, a license, how long you will say what's the range of time normally that will it take well, yeah. to apply and get it approved? In, in general terms, right, so let's let's have a very, very brief discussion about two of the most common types of license, the open license. The open general export license is, uh, there's over 40 of them. If you can use an open license, you use it, and you don't actually have to apply to, to each time you use it. <clears throat> you register to use it on Spire uh, prior to the first time you use it, and you get that approval within 24 hours generally. Uh, to to actually, once you've registered to use it, and then you can use that open general export license whenever you want uh, without further ado, uh, so to speak. You don't have to apply to use it each and every time. So general open licenses or open general licenses are the best ones to use if you can use it. Uh, the, the downside on that is you have to keep a record of all your exports, all the documentation, and every time you do use it, because that is what the ECGU will come and audit and you will be open for audit uh, if you apply if you register to use an OGL. Uh, so you're opening the door to ECGU, which is a good thing. Uh, the second thing is on a seal, you've got to make sure it's a single individual export license. You've got to make sure you've got all your ducks in a row before you get your application in. And nine times out of 10, uh, delays are caused by uh, internal process delays, ha not having their end user documentation in line not having the correct uh, purchase orders, the addresses on purchase orders, et cetera, et cetera, because uh, that can all lead to delay. You need, you need to get in a good quality uh, application 
uh, make sure there's no technical concerns from uh, the ECGU. So you want to keep it relatively simple, but uh, quite uh, detailed. It's a, a difference, in, sort of a, a contradiction there. Uh, it's got to be detailed enough, but not too detailed that it's going to cause confusion. Don't be ambiguous. Uh, get a good, clear uh, uh, application in. Uh, then it makes life easy for the technical assessment to be conducted uh, and then for the, the go around the, the, the boards uh, around other government departments. And that could take up to six weeks okay. from application. But you've got to make sure you get a good application in. And if you don't get a good application in because you rush it, then that can take longer and it's your own fault, really. Oh, of course. And has there been instances, I mean, from what I can gather is, yes, you apply online, you submit information, but are there any instances where the ECU will prefer to go to your premises or, you, you know, have like a physical inspection of the product or anything like that in order to grant you the export license? Well, I mean, you mean customers viewing uh, product on your premises? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they apply for something, they submitted the paperwork, but, you know, yeah. for X, Y, Z reason, they said, well, actually, we want to come and see the product. And yeah, there's no there's no problem. Uh, and this is, right, this is where uh, security, uh, national security and uh, the, the Official Secrets Act, et cetera, comes into it uh, versus... Uh, arms control, trade control. The trade controls cover the export of the goods and technologies. They're not primarily there, even though we do say we're concerned about the uh, security. Uh, they're not primarily there to enforce uh, the, the Official Secrets Act per se. Now, I've not mentioned it here, but the Form 680 uh, uh, deals with uh, export of classified materials or letting other people see your classified materials uh, if they are classified and, and you would have uh, restrictions placed on that anyway uh, by the, the, the government and probably the Ministry of Defence about who can and can't see it uh, outside export control. Uh, but yeah, there's Form 680 is basically a release from the Ministry of Defence uh, to allow you to export classified material, UK classified material. That is over and above the license. It's separate to the license. Just because you've got the Form 680 from the MOD, it's not an export license. And likewise, having the export license does not mean that you can export it if it's classified. You need also the MOD approval. So they're, they're, they're slightly different on that. The American side of it is more tied up. But that brings its own problems with the ITAR regulations, uh, which we're not going into today. Uh, but yeah, so they're, they're, they're separate but related uh, on classified material uh, and the movement of. Okay, thank you. I have two questions from the audience, so I'm just gonna read them. Uh, if you cannot find your goods on the goods checker, how can you check if a license is needed? Ah, well, here's the, here's the gotcha. If they're not on the, uh, on the goods checker, right. So I assume they're using the online goods checker uh, to try and find an item. Well, that is a, a blunt instrument. Uh, your, your ultimate list is the strategic arms control list. If it's not on there, it's classified as not listed and therefore does not require a license. That's NLR, no license required. Uh, so, yeah, I, it's a, yeah, the goods checker is a, a fairly rough instrument. Uh, so just be careful of that, uh, but get into the street. It's a 310 page document. The uh, dual use list ones are the most difficult to establish if it's listed or not. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you can tell if you're, and if you get any doubts and you can say it, you can always go to ECGU, uh, you know, or, or a consultant, export control consultant, and you can come in and I, I can do determination. But, you know, sometimes, uh, there's a lot of discussion to whether something is covered by a, you know, the detail, uh, but that's, by the time you get down to that level, you know what, you're probably about applying for other licenses anyway, uh, depending on your industry. So, yeah. Thank you. I got another. 
Recent fines were breach of these registrations running into the hundreds of thousands of pounds, having published by the identity of the firm's concern has not, because it is not, according to HMRC, in the public interest. For the lesser amount of amounts, the identity has been given. What is your opinion about this? Uh, ah, okay then, right, uh, right. So the, that's interesting, right? So the, 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 the reason that maybe not been published is because the fines that you read in the notice to exporters, uh, they've not been prosecuted. The majority of the, the fines, that, they're not fines if you read it, they're actually payments and they're, they're actually been out of court settlements that have been made. So instead of HMRC saying, look, this is really boring, you've breached the regulations, uh, give us a hundred thousand pounds, and some of them do stretch into not just tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands, give us uh, 250,000 uh, pounds and we'll call it quits. Uh, and it's an out of court settlement. And that's why you'll probably find that the identities have not been published. If, it's a, if it goes through the courts, and generally speaking, the out of court settlement, you can take that number and double it. Uh, and that's why people pay the out of court settlement. Uh, then they will then, you've got, you know, they'll be in the, go through the courts and it will be name all, see all, yeah, tell all, unless it's gover governed by official secrets of the courts. Okay, got another one. You mentioned six weeks from date of application to yeah. grant of license. Is this typical and expected or has it worsened in recent months? Are no. civil servants increasingly perceived as working to rule? Mm, right, interesting question. The fact is you've identified two, well, maybe three uh, points there. First, the six weeks is a aspirational date. It's a KPI for them. Uh, and generally speaking, they do stand up quite well uh, to that, uh, depending on uh, your product and your location. Sometimes uh, work, civil servants working to rule Okay, firstly, they are civil servants, got to understand that. Uh, and I'm not demeaning uh, or bad-mouthing civil servants, but uh, the fact is they will take, do what it takes to do. Uh, also, they're under a lot of pressure, uh, or they, they sometimes can become under a lot of pressure and they'll just brush it off uh, from politics. So I've seen people trying to go through uh, the political chains. And of course, by the time it got up to the minister and then all the way back down again, by the time it gets to the civil servant sitting on the desk, there's a human nature aspect that drives in that. Uh, generally speaking, what I've seen uh, where there's been delays, uh, a one, not as it's been a, a year and a half, two years ago now, was uh, there was a, the, the government was taken to court, the high court, uh, over the granting of licenses to uh, countries involved in the Yemen. And there was effectively a monitorium placed on uh, the issuing of licenses to uh, the Arab coalition that was involved in uh, the conflict in Yemen. Uh, and that caused uh, a real backlog. Uh, so they weren't actually, you know, yes, they were working to rule because they were under getting prosecuted at that time in the high court, the government was. Uh, but I don't see sort of any malicious actions and I'm not aware of any delays at the moment. But you can get, and sometimes you get delays where they come back and they'll ask questions for clarification on technical. And yeah, but you're, you're, you've also got, always got a technical, uh, your uh, case officer who should be able to answer any questions uh, if there's a specific delay on a specific license and they should be able to give you an update and guidance on to why the delay is. And then uh, you've got a better understanding or you can assist them in clearing out that blockage. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff. I don't see any more questions uh, on, on it. So before we go, thank you so much, Jeff, for sharing all, uh, all these. I think it was very comprehensive. And if you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to your local chamber and uh, we will make sure that somebody uh, can give you some support on that. So before we close up, if I can ask you to please quickly to uh, answer a quick poll that we've got, and especially we're interested to know uh, what kind of um, 
uh, topics you would like us to cover in the future for the next set of the Chamber Trade Academy session. So if I, if I can ask you to just uh, quickly answer the poll that is showing on your screen, I will be deeply grateful. Thank you. And um, Jeff, if, if just the last one is, um, is there any final top tips that you would like to give to exporters about how to go on about, you know, applying for an export uh, license? Just yeah, I mean, the, the understanding of export licenses and how to make an application, I think, is vitally important, uh, along with determination of goods. Uh, how do you determine your goods uh, and as a, you know, as a company? Uh, how do you record that? How do you change it if you've decided that it's changing? How do you update it? Uh, I think uh, having an integrated business process is key uh, to your, your export control. Often it's just left to one person sitting in uh, a vacuum almost in the company. The, but in fact, export compliance takes place across a company. So it should be integrated across your whole business management system or quality management system. Uh, if you're at ISO 9001, for instance. No, thank you so much. Well, I think uh, that's it from us today. And uh, stay tuned and uh, register with your local chamber. We will be uh, putting more sessions um, in the autumn period. So if you have any other things that you want to uh, talk to us, then as I said, just contact your local chamber. And as we mentioned earlier at the start, the slides and the recording will be sent out as a follow-up. Uh, by individual chambers. So thank you for joining us today and wishing you a great uh, week.